All right, let's open our Bibles this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. So we continue through this letter that Paul wrote. When Paul came to Corinth, it couldn't have been a worse time for him. He had spent months and years on the road. He had been beaten up and spit on and chased out of every town he'd visited. He showed up by himself. His friends were trailing behind him for months. He really thought about quitting, giving up. He, he just didn't want to get knocked in the head anymore. He just didn't feel like he was getting anywhere. So he didn't preach to anyone. He'd show up at the synagogue, but that was about it. When his friends showed up, he was a bit encouraged to do what he had been called to do. But it was even better when the Lord showed up one night and said to him, Paul, I'm going to protect you in this city. And for the next 18 months, Paul preached his little heart out. And this very corrupt place that was really the center of idolatry in, in the south of, of uh, Greece, if you will, Achaia, and then in Macedonia, he saw the Lord do these wonderful things. The church was born, it grew. Because it was a big idolatrous city, the, the people brought their problems with them into the church. It wasn't a perfect place, but it was growing. So Paul left there excited that the Lord had begun this work it wasn't until five years later when he was in Ephesus that he heard that these Judaizers, this, this false group that had followed him around for years, had infiltrated this Corinthian church as well. They, they came in claiming to be apostles. They claimed a higher knowledge than other people had. They had secret wisdom. They, they came with uh, endorsement of celebrities in Jerusalem. They, they, they spoke about uh, the law and, and works, and they, they slowly began to pull people away from the, from the grace that they had found in Christ. They were like wolves among the sheep. They caused division and, and, and hatred, and they lied, and their methods were horrible. They turned on Paul and tried to do, you know, just question everything he had ever done and said because to undermine Paul was to undermine his work. And so Paul was heartbroken. He, he heard about it. He wrote four letters to them. This is the fourth one. We have two of them. He had made an unscheduled trip there to try to you know, head things off, and it didn't go well. Well over a year had passed before he finally got news uh, from Titus, who he sent there, that things were turning the corner, that a lot of people were back on board and back with the things of God, but there were still these in, entrenched kind of teachers who were horrible and, and leading people away from the things of God. And so Paul writes his force, uh, this letter before he sends it ahead. These last four chapters especially, they're not kind and merciful like the first seven. They're, they're angry and, and, and authoritative as Paul the apostle writes, look, I'm representing the Lord and this is not going to last. And so he, he, he demands you know, uh, repentance or else. You guys are going to meet you know, the other side of the, of the coin. This morning in the first six chapter, uh, verses sorry, of chapter 11, Paul speaks to them as a father would, would write to his child. He, he's jealous over their affection. He wanted them to remain faithful to Jesus. He was uh, worried about them being deceived. He wanted the church to have good discernment. So in this process, he begins to do something which is pretty distasteful to him. He begins to brag, not for his own glory so that people go, oh, isn't Paul great? He begins to brag about what the Lord has done with him. And then he asks them to set him aside or, or beside those that were there trying to take advantage of him. He talked about his attitude, his willing to su uh, suffer, the, the message that he brought, the, the way that he was willing to work for free and not require anything of them, that he was willing to just be diligent and, and faithful and, and ask them, did, did they see that in the lives of these folks that were uh, you know, deceiving them? He, he couldn't let them go unchallenged. But, but he'll apologize a half a dozen times. I'm sorry that this is the course I'm taking. I'm not even sure if this is the Lord's best, he'd say. But, but I want you to, to look at the difference. I don't want to lose you to these guys. There are probably few people we despise more than traitors. They're more, all usually uh, despicable, I think, in any culture. You know, if I said Benedict Arnold, you go, traitor. Judas, nobody names their kid Judas anymore because he was a traitor. Uh, on the other side of traitor is, is all of the good things. Loyalty, faithfulness, allegiance, fidelity, devotion, the kind of things that, that, that we like in friends. It's also the kind of things God wants in us. And so there is a call always to us to be 
trustworthy in our relationship with God. There's a verse in uh, Proverbs chapter 20 that says, most, most men will proclaim their own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? The word there, faithful, is the word for being trustworthy. It's important in our relationships with people to be trustworthy. If you have a friend that isn't, he won't be your friend very long. If someone, you can't depend on them, you don't know if they're telling you the truth, they're always kind of hedging and, and you're not really dependable, they're, they're hard to keep as friends. It, it becomes even more important if that's possible when it comes to your relationship with God because you're supposed to be trustworthy as his child to your father. But that loyalty won't come easily. Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 10 said to the disciples, don't think I've come to bring peace upon the earth. I've come to bring a sword. I'm going to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A men's enemies are going to be from his own family. And if you love your mother and your father more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love your son or daughter more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you don't pick up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of me. Those are pretty strong words. But, but it is, uh, you know, it goes to the heart of, of loyalty and devotion that the Lord would call that uh, from us. Throughout the Bible, where you, wherever you find God at work, there is this call upon his people to be loyal. David, when he, in First Chronicles, I guess chapter 28 or so, was ready to hand the reins of the, of the country to his son. He called him aside and he said, now Solomon, my son, know the Lord of your fathers, the God of your fathers. Serve him with a loyal heart, with a ready mind. He knows your intents. He'll be found of you if you seek for him. He'll forsake you if you forsake him. Be loyal to the Lord. In the next chapter of 1 Chronicles 29, the public gets together to pray for Solomon. And David prays first, and he says out loud in front of the people, Lord, give my son a loyal heart so he can keep your commandments and your testimonies, your statutes, so he can do all these things that you've set up before him, but, but make him loyal. If you read through the, the stories of the kings in the Old Testament, you'll find that there were lots of kings who were very loyal to the Lord. It's an important word, trustworthy in their relationship. Guys like Hezekiah, just totally trustworthy, Asa, totally trustworthy. But then there was a lot of guys that weren't. Ahaziah, or Am Amaziah, I should say, was a fellow that you will read about in Second Chronicles 25, and it will say he was 25 years old when he became king. He reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, comma, but not with a loyal heart. He was a good guy. Did a lot of good things, but his relationship to the Lord was inconsistent. His loyalty was not always there. And that seemed to be a, a description of a lot of folks. Now, if, if we take that to the level of your marriage, how would you like to have a wife that is usually loyal? Or a husband that's mostly okay? Like, okay, he messed up 12 times last year, but there's 365 days. He's doing pretty good. You wouldn't want that. Well, neither does the Lord. He wants us to be loyal in our relationship with him. When the Lord sent the prophet Hosea to the children of Israel, chapter six, I think, and they weren't doing very well spiritually, the Lord said through Hosea, your faithfulness is like the morning dew. It soon dissipates. It doesn't last. There's no really trustworthiness. And unfortunately, that's true of the church as well. And it was, it was true for the churches in the first century. It's, it's true for the church today. You remember that story in Antioch when Peter was eating with his Gentile buddies, having the burritos or whatever he was having. And then the, the, the religious folks from James showed up from Jerusalem. And they were legalists, man. And Peter, without even batting an eye, got up and he moved to the kosher table. And Barnabas joined in, and a lot of the people that looked up to Peter were stumbled by it. And Paul said, because he was not straightforward with the truth of the gospel, I withstood him to his face. He wasn't loyal. He didn't represent the Lord properly. And it caused a conflict. Five of the seven churches that Jesus will write to in the book of Revelation were found in some level of disloyalty. 
when they should have remained loyal. Well, Paul's concern for the Corinthians was that because of these false teachers who are very deceptive, I, I love when people say, I'll never be deceived, but you don't understand the word deceived means you are deceived. How would you know? They, they got you. Well, no, they didn't. No, they got you. So how do you protect yourself from being deceived? Paul was interested that they wouldn't be, that these false teachers wouldn't lead them away from the loyalty that they had initially shown to Jesus. Because the, the salvation of God is simple, easily understood. But these men were leading folks away. So he says in verse one, oh, that you would bear with me just in a little folly, and indeed you're bearing with me. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I've betrothed you to one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm jealous over you. You read jealousy, most people think that's bad. It's like the green envy thing, right? And that's usually biblically right. But when it comes to God's desire to have your trustworthiness, it's a good word. And the Lord will even say of himself, uh, Exodus 34, 35, I'm a jealous God. Could you really blame him for wanting you to be faithful to him? Any more than you could blame a husband and say to his wife, you gotta be faithful to me. If this marriage is gonna work out, it's gotta be you and me alone. So the Lord with us. He's a jealous God. He, he, he loves his people. Well, Paul felt like that for this church that he had helped birth. He, he'd gotten them right with God. He's told them the, the, the grace of God, the, the, the goodness of Jesus. He, he prepared them for what was coming. And now he saw the, the danger of, men, of, of losing them to these legalists and these cultics and the, these mystic, uh, mystics who are just, you know, muddling the waters and, 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 and driving people away from Christ. I'm jealous for you. <clears throat> Marriage in the days of Jesus or the days of Paul were, was mostly by arrangement of the parents. It was just the typical practice. Sometimes it was for financial gain, sometimes for business interest, sometimes for political expediency, sometimes just because you, know, you love the other family and you like to have the kids get together. And it's just the way things were. It was usually done while the kids were very young. Eventually, as they grew older, though, these kids would enter into a relationship called the espousal period. By Jewish practice, when you were espoused, you were married. The, the only thing was you weren't living with your wife or husband and there was no sexual contact yet. For one year, you lived at home, but you were married. You were married legally. If there was financial responsibility, it would fall to both of you. If you wanted to get a divorce, it would take a, a, a law and a, a signature uh, it was just uh, marriage in every sense of the word except physical contact and, and being together. It, it lasted for a year. It was during that betrothal, you might remember, that Mary showed up with child. And thus the dilemma, what do we do and how did this happen and all. Well, notice that Paul uses this word betrothal, if you will, uh, verse 2, to picture your relationship and my relationship with God. You know, the Bible says of the church that we are the bride of Christ. Now, we're not married yet. We haven't seen him yet, but we're waiting, right? And like a father of the bride, Paul wanted to be sure that he could present his daughter, his bride, if you will, as a chaste virgin to the Lord. He would say in the first Corinthian letters, I know you've had 10,000 instructors in Christ, but you don't have many fathers who have begotten you. He felt that kind of a relationship as a dad, if you will, to the church. Well, for you and I, soon day, someday soon, the wedding's coming. We're going to get raptured. Won't that be a good day? And then somewhere after that, in heaven, there will be the wedding feast of the Lamb. We're going to all be married. We're going we're to be with Jesus ever like that, so we will be. And then we'll return with him to the earth to rule and to reign. But for now, you're betrothed. <laughs> and there are in the world and around you different suitors who would like to draw you away from your loyalty in your relationship with Jesus. 
They will present to you a different gospel. They will operate by a different spirit. They will preach to you another Jesus. Their goal is what these guys were in this church. They want you unfaithful. They want you joined to another God. When Jeremiah wrote to the children of Israel at a time when they were just doing poorly, the Lord said to Jeremiah in chapter two, say to the nation of Israel, thus saith the Lord, I remember you in the kindness of your youth, in the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in a wilderness, in a land that wasn't so. You were holiness to me. And anyone who, who would devour you would be disastrous for them. God protected them. And then he said, but let me ask you now something, you children of Jacob, you house of Israel. What happened to you? What injustice did your fathers find in me that you've now gone away from me? You've become idolaters. You followed idols. The Lord, in speaking of the, the once relationship with the nation, said there was a good time. Everything was good. You loved me. You had eyes for me only. And I protected you and I blessed you. But something happened. You became disloyal. And as a result, you know, the, the sufferings began as well. Jesus said to the Ephesian church, huge church, real productive church, I only have one problem with you. You have left your first love. Not lost it. It's one thing to lose it. You left it. That's a choice matter. You remember the story of um, Abraham's servant Eliezer being sent by his master uh, Abraham to go find a bride for his son Isaac back from the family that he had come from. And Eliezer was not particularly excited about it because he thought, he thought well, first of all, it's a long way away. Uh, how am I going to bring you someone that's never met you? And, and then what if I have trouble? You know, am I supposed to drag her here? What am I supposed to do? And, and Abraham said, just let the Lord lead. And if it doesn't work out, it's not on you. It's on him. But you go see what God wants to do. And you might remember the story that when Eliezer get, came to the area of Abraham's family, God miraculously brought this beautiful woman to the well. He, she invited him to, to have his uh, camel and all watered, just as he had prayed, Lord, just show me. She invited him home to meet her family. And over the next couple of days, as he sat there and began to explain who he was and where he'd come from, he finally turned to this little girl and he said, will you go with me to this man? And she said, I, I will. And so a few days later, they left. She got on the back of a camel or on a donkey, I don't know. But they had to travel for hundreds of miles. And, and she'd never met Isaac, <clears throat> but every day she heard about him. And every day that she heard about him, she got more excited. I want to meet him. This guy sounds wonderful. Too good to be true. How tall is he again? <laughs> Color is his hair. Eventually, Eliezer said to him, to her, you're going to see him very, very soon. But it's a beautiful picture because this is exactly what we experience today. The Holy Spirit is in the world looking for a bride for Jesus. And you're part of that church that have come to know him. We're the bride. We're the church. We're a spouse to him. We're betrothed. We're married. We're, we're, we're loyal. We're, we're all in with him. We're not cheating on him. We're going to go with him. But we wait. And the temptation is to be unfaithful now. That someone is standing on the corner with a nod, nod, and a wink, wink, and you know, you're supposed to remain a chaste virgin for Christ, devoted to one, but, but the false teachers, they have other ideas and, and other offers. So Paul says in verse three, I'm afraid of that. I'm afraid that somehow, through the deceitfulness of the enemy, through the snake that was in the grass, he through his craftiness, the word is, trickery or, or cunningness will somehow corrupt your mind. And the word corrupt there is the, is the Greek word for to seduce. You'll be taken in by this new offer, by this new God. And you'll be turned away from the things that are just simple in Christ, the simplicity that is in Christ. The, the problem for the Corinthians, and sometimes for us, is we can show an alarming kind of susceptibility to being deceived by, by the lies of the enemy rather than being established in the word of God. And we, we're willing to follow another Jesus or, or be moved by another spirit or, or, or have a, a, a hear another gospel. You know, when, when Satan 
came to Eve, the first thing he said was, uh, well, the first thing he did was question God. Has God really said? When Eve explained what she understood God having said, he then denied what God said. He said, you won't die. And, and thirdly, he takes what God has said and he replaces it with his own lie. You'll just be like God. You'll see things as, as, as he does. Now, I don't doubt that Eve wanted the best or desired the best, but that's how deception works. And because of her deception and, and her husband joining in the rebellion, sin entered, in, sin entered into the world. So here's a bunch of false teachers in Corinth who were led of their father, the devil, who had the same desire in mind, deceive the souls of those God had chosen and called whatever it takes. And Paul bothered Paul. For me as a pastor, I think the, the, the hardest thing is when you watch people walk away from the Lord. Paul, when he, in this chapter a little later, will begin to describe the sufferings that he's gone through to serve the Lord over the years that he had. And it's a long list. And when you read it, and if you try to apply it to yourself, you'd say, yeah, I'd have quit a long time ago. But he lists all of these horrible things to serve the Lord. And then he says in chapter 11, verse 28, and besides all that is the daily care of all the church. It's a word that means to, to have like an emotional concern. He, he just couldn't get the church off of his mind. So besides all of the physical abuse and the difficulty and the challenges, it was the, the people and how they were doing that concerned him. He wrote to Timothy when he saw him and placed him in the pastorate in, in, in Ephesus. Timothy, the spirit expressly says that in the last days, some will depart from the faith. They'll give heed to seducing spirits, the doctrines of demons. They'll speak lies and hypocrisy, they'll have their own conscience seared with a hot iron, they'll tell you you can't get married or you can't eat certain foods and they'll just begin to lay on you the things that God never intended to lay on you at all. The, the bottom line is the church could use a healthy dose of discernment. We should be careful. Paul, when he wrote to the Ephesians, said in chapter four, verse 14, I'm praying for you that you no longer be tossed around like kids back and forth carried around by every wind of doctrine that blows through by the trickery of men in their cunning craftiness and then their deceitful plotting, you should at some point find your feet under you and be able to stand fast. The church needs that. We need that to be able to, to stand against these things. But Paul, he worried about the church. The church's willingness today to tolerate evil for the sake of unity is destroying us. There is a truth, and, and to love people is to tell them the truth. Now, if you speak the truth about sin in our society, they'll tell you that you're not lovely, you're not kind, you're not merciful. I had a guy right in my face the other day, said, you Christians are all so hateful. I said, you think it'd be hateful to tell a kid not to smoke because it's gonna kill him one day? He goes, no, that's important. I said, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're telling you how you can keep out of hell. You don't like that, get mad at me, but I'm still going to tell you. We need to be able to, to stand for the truth and not cover the truth for the sake of unity. It's not worth it. And then we have churches, for the most part, that are not really biblically sound. We, we don't have the doctrines that we know. We don't have the, the ability to use them. And so we're crippled in our ability to overcome deceit or we become easy praise for these clowns on television or the, you know, the guy with the, the, the biggest bullhorn that's gonna yell at us about what we should and shouldn't do. Jesus said very clearly, beware of the false prophets. They're coming to you in sheep's clothing, even though inwardly they're ravenous wolves. We have to be careful. Paul said to the Ephesians on his way out the door, Acts chapter 20, verse 29, I know that when I depart, savage wolves are gonna come in, not sparing the flock. So Paul said, I, I'm, I'm worried that the enemy somehow got the upper hand with you. But, but notice what his, what, he, what his greatest fear was, that they would be corrupted in what they understand about God and be, be moved away from the simplicity that's in Christ. It's a great word, isn't it? One of the things that is typical to cults and false teaching is that they will make the way of life extremely difficult. They'll give you pages of things you have to do and then you're not even sure. Well, then we got this. And then have you taken the advanced course and not knowing? Oh, no, I haven't, but I probably should have. And they just pile it on. Look, we had VBS a couple of weeks ago, hundreds of kids. 
And many of them gave their lives to Jesus. And you say, well, what does that mean? They'll say, Jesus died for my sins and I need him to go to heaven. You're thinking, ta-da, they got it. Now you can dig in God's word to the depths and you'll never run out of things to mine. But the gospel is very simple and very clear. It needs to be that way. A religion that adds to, to faith in Jesus is a false religion. The false teachers were changing the focus from Jesus to rituals and ceremonies and good works and emotional responses and politics or social causes. Anything but Christ. I, I, over the years, the people I've seen leave here that have gone in those directions who I know have come to the Lord and, and given Jesus their life, they will always run towards the ritual stuff, the ceremonial stuff. That, that's what you gotta do. You gotta wear one of these and say one of these and stand over here. Really? I thought I just got saved by grace, faith. No, no, no. That's where you start. <laughs> no, no, that's where you end. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, he said this, if any man does not love Je the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Ah, oh, come on, Paul, that's no way to make friends. But it is a way to tell the truth. So he says in verse six, uh, verse four, sorry, these things, if he would come and preach another Jesus whom we haven't preached, if you re would receive a different spirit which you haven't received, or a different gospel which you, haven't ex which you have not accepted, that you would well be to put up with it. Or in other words, you'll make room for this. You'll make room for another Jesus. You'll make room for another spirit. You'll make room for another gospel. Wrong spirit, wrong way, wrong God. Because the Jesus of the cults is not the Jesus of the Bible. So when cults or, or, or religious people say, we believe in Jesus too, it is right for you to go, which one? Because our God is, 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 the, is God come in the flesh, born of a virgin, the creator of the heavens and the earth, fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, who came and, and did marvelous miracles to prove to us and assess to who he was. He died an atoning death. He rose on the third day. He ascended into heaven. He's coming again. Jesus of the Bible. But an aberrant view of Christ is at the hallmark of false religions. The Jesus of the Mormon church is the spirit brother of, Ju of Lucifer, not the only begotten son of the father. The goal of Mormons is to become gods of your own planet while the rest of the angels serve you. That sounds more like Satan's lies in the garden to me than the word of God. When the cults say, we believe in Jesus, you better say, which one? I grew up as a Catholic. I was saved at, at about 18. Um, I went to parochial school for 12 years. When I got saved and started reading the Bible, I realized something that, that not everyone would agree with, but I believe that the Catholic Jesus is the right Jesus. In other words, what they believe about him, removed church practices, just from a theological standpoint, is right. Only begotten of the Father, born of a virgin, died for my sins, rose again. Having said that, and because of that, I know 80% of you have Catholic backgrounds, which is interesting that you're here. But Jesus in the Catholic Church has been buried under a lot of stuff. The false teaching of the church. Buried under the saints. Buried under the worship of Mary. Buried under the fallacy of the popes and his influence. Buried under ever changing church practices. I still remember the, being an altar boy in, in the mass in Latin. I can't even get that out of my head. Adiem quilatificate uventutum meum. I know the whole thing still. <laughs> no updating here. But if you remove all of those things, it's the right Jesus, which makes it easy for you if you're an ex-Catholic or, or a Catholic, whatever you want to call yourself, just means universal anyway, uh, to lean into Jesus because he's, he's, the, he's the Jesus that you want to know. It's much harder to come from these cultic rooms, uh, you know, homes where you, you have to formulate a whole new concept of who God is. But that was Paul's worry, that some other Jesus was going to be presented to them. And for the Judaizers, it has everything to do with self and performance and the law and ritual. And Paul said, man, if you could, if you make room for this, if you could put up with this, I would grieve. That, that, I don't want that to have a place in your life. There should be no place in my life for that. 
I have a friend who came out of the Jehovah Witness Church, and he, he so wants to go back and reach his family and friends, and he thought that the best way to go would be to study Jehovah Witness theology, or their idea, idea of theology. And I said to him, why don't you just read your Bible? And whatever they bring up, you go, yeah, that's not in the Bible. Here's what's in the Bible. If you, if you turn on the light, the darkness goes away much quicker than studying the darkness. Well, Paul ends in verse 5 and 6 with this. I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostle, even though I'm untrained in my speech. I'm not untrained, literally, in my knowledge, but have thoroughly manifest among you in all of these things. Now, Paul is going to be very sarcastic in the next couple of chapters. I just appreciate that so much. I believe sarcasm to be a gift of the Spirit. Maybe not the Holy Spirit, but it is a definite gift, and I enjoy it tremendously. But he says in verse 5, and he's very sarcastic, I guess I'm really not any worse off than your most eminent apostle. He's not talking about Peter and James and John and those guys. He's talking about these false apostles that have come to the church. The word eminent here means special or super. He's just kind of sarcastically saying, yeah, I guess I don't really, I'm not really behind in any of those guys except I don't speak like they do. Right? I don't, I don't come with, I'm not as eloquent. I'm untrained in my speech. I, I don't follow those skills that the Greek orators just are so impressed by. I wasn't interested in theatrics or pre- presentation. But I'll tell you what I have done. I've lived my life in faith in God and the fruit should be showing. Again, he's, he wants to put himself out there to be a comparison. Look at them, really polished in their speech. Look at my life and look at theirs. And Paul says, you do well to look at the knowledge of the truth that I lived out before you day and night for 18 months as the church was being planted. Paul had offered them the entire word of God. He said it to the Ephesians in chapter 20, I think verse 27. I haven't failed to deliver to you the whole counsel of God's word. Now I want to, I want to point this out before we stop this, this morning. And that is there's probably no better teacher in the New Testament than Paul, at least in what we're given. I mean, the fruit of his life, the the churches he planted, the the disciples he made, the doctrines that he wrote, you know, the book of Romans or, or, or the book of Hebrews. I mean, the guy had a phenomenal mind and a great anointing. But having said all of that, after 18 months of his teaching in Corinth, this still happened. There were still folks in the church who I knew he's gone went, yeah, maybe this guy, this old false apostle is the right apostle. Maybe I shouldn't just be trusting in Jesus. I should be doing these things over here. And there was a move in the church away from Christ, even though they had been better taught than probably anyone might have hoped to be. So even with Paul's solid and, and consistent kind of exposition of the scriptures, there were still folks who had fallen to the deceptiveness of these false teachers. And I bring that up because you might say it'll never happen to me, and I would say it could happen to you. It could happen to you. We don't want it to happen to you, but the the safeguard is learn your Bible. Pray and study and walk with God in such a way that you immediately can identify uh, the next deceiver when he comes upon the scene in, in sheep's clothing. Because there's plenty of suitors out there that want to get you to be unfaithful to your relationship with Christ and begin to follow them down a road that doesn't lead to life. Know what you believe about praying. When someone says, why do you pray? Well, here's why I pray. Well, how do I have to get, why do I have to be saved? Because this is what the Bible says. What about the end times? Oh, this is what I believe. This is what I'm waiting for. Be a student of the scriptures. Paul, when he wrote to the Galatians, which had kind of the same problem, said in chapter one, verse six, I marvel that you so quickly turn away from him who called you by his grace to Christ and you've turned to another gospel, a different gospel. It can happen to you, it can happen to me. Be careful, be careful. And this strategy, unfortunately, is repeated a lot. Five of the seven churches Jesus addressed in the book of Revelation were churches that were either founded under Paul's ministry or influenced by his leadership, and yet they were told they had a problem. So even just good teaching is is important, but if you don't apply it, if you don't make use of it, if you don't give yourself over to it, you, you won't be safe either. Keep it simple. Learn of Jesus, know him well in his word, and you'll be fine. But don't think that the enemy isn't working night and day to destroy the very things that God has begun to work. 
Next week we'll pick up in verse 7, so read ahead. Or don't come back. No, I'm just kidding. I'll read it to you. I'm always in my... You know, if you just don't say everything that's in your head, you're awfully better off. But <laughs> what do I know? Father, we love you this morning and so thankful that you have, are warning us to that there is certainly a faithfulness that you long for in, in our relationship with you, a trustworthiness. We don't want to be traitors to the faith. We, we, we want to be faithful, chaste virgins of God waiting for that day of marriage when this betrothal period will have ended and we'll be with you and we'll see you face to face. We know it's coming soon. We pray, Lord, that you would find us while we wait engaged in telling the world about you and keeping ourselves pure from the, from the false teachers who stand on every corner to, to, see to, to, to seek to turn us away from you. May we just stay sim simple and convinced with blinders on. May we just follow you in, in, in love. And today, if you're in church and you don't know Jesus, look, I'll tell you how you can figure out immediately if you don't know him. If someone says to you, how are you going to go to heaven or are you? If the first word out of your mouth is not because of Jesus, then you're going to need to turn and reevaluate. Because without him, there's no other name given among men whereby you can be saved. Because he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. And if you come to him, the Father won't turn you away. His name will open the door. His, his life will save you from your sins. His, his death will pay the price for what we've done. And his love will assure you that he'll never leave you or forsake you, but one day present you faultless before his Father's throne with amazing glory and joy. You need Jesus in your life. If you don't have him, come and talk to one of the guys today and, and let them open the Bible and show you what God can do and what God promises to do. Because you need to be saved. And you need Christ. And there's no life without him. I don't care how popular the guy on TV is who tells you otherwise. There is no life without Jesus. Today, the Lord will give you that life. And then if you come and pray, you can come and be baptized a couple hours from now. It's going to be awesome. What a day it will be for you. The day you let Jesus in. God, help us not to be deceived, but to stand upon the clear evidence and truth of your word. Shall we stand?